If you have your Bible tonight, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 3. The book of Revelation, we believe, has been given through the Gospel writer John to the churches of Asia Minor. And we have looked at six of them. We're coming to the last of these churches. We believe they are literal churches in that area, commonly known as Turkey. And the church that we're going to focus on tonight is called Laodicea. There's been a name, kind of a nickname, attached to each of these, and the church that we'll be looking at to tonight is known as the Lukewarm Church. But if you do a, a study in the word church, the word church means ecclesia in the biblical terms, a called out assembly. We've looked at six of them. The Lord addresses needs in every one of them, and just to highlight maybe singularly some of them, the church at Ephesus was the first we looked at. It was the church that left their first love. Some have called it the loveless church. Then there's the church of Smyrna, which endured hardship, persecution. We would say it's a persecuted church, and the Lord says, be thou faithful unto death. Then we looked at the church of Pergamos. It allowed teachers inside their congregation to cause them to compromise the sacred teachings of truth. And then we looked a little bit further to the church of Thyatira, the church that allowed immorality, outright wickedness and sin. And, uh, and we would say it's the corrupted church. And then we go to the church of uh, Sardis. And the Lord said that church was just about dead and they were to strengthen the things that remained that were ready to die. And now we come to the last church here, the church of, La or the next church would be the church of Philadelphia. And we would say that church represents, and by the way, all of these church, church represent time frames. The church of Philadelphia was a faithful church. Only two churches that have, have no negative things spoken of by our Lord the Church of Philadelphia, and the Church of Smyrna. Now, this last church is a church that would represent, even according to those that write heavily on this subject, current day church. Every congregation has needs. Every individual has spiritual needs. And we're going to pick up in verse number 14 and following. And we welcome our friends online. We thank the Lord for the opportunity that we have to teach the Bible. And so if you need a Bible, please know you're, you're encouraged to know we can offer that here. Verse 14, And unto the angel, that will be the messenger, of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. We'll pause right there. We'll read some more in just a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've made, and we pray for guidance now. We thank you for the word of God and reminding us of the needs of every church and, and Lord, the challenge that we have seen and, and the blessing and the inspiration that we can gather from every one of them. And Lord, as we come to this final church that you've addressed at the beginning of the book of Revelation, we pray you'll speak to us. And Lord, that we might be open and willing to do thy will. And Lord, we'll give you thanks and praise for what you do. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Just a little historical background on Laodicea. It was on a... You would say a business route, industrial route, mail route. Laodicea is about 40 miles southeast of the Church of Philadelphia. And it's set up on somewhat of a high area. And there was two areas that in this passage might have a connection as the Lord dresses. One would be Hierapolis where they had the hot mineral springs and uh, on the other side, southward, will be a place called Laodicea, or excuse me, Colossae, where they had the cold freezing streams. 
Now, looking at all the research that's been done, this particular area was a very wealthy place. They had industrial, great textiles. They were known for their black wool material clothing they sold. Also, the city had a medical school program, as I understand it, and they developed an eye salve to help healing for the eyes and to help medicate the eyes that people would travel a great distance. Because of their business entrepreneurship, they actually became a centralized banking system for that particular area. They were so wealthy that in in the history of Laodicea, they had an earthquake, and when Rome was willing to lend them financial aid, they turned it down because they had the wealth to be able to reconstruct and make all the repairs. The, La- the city of Laodicea was located near Colossae and Her- Heriopolis, about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. Antiochus II named the city after his wife, Laodice, which means just or the justice for the people. Now, when we've read each of these uh, messages, these letters to the churches, the Lord usually gives them a name by which he identifies who's speaking. In this case, it's found in verse 14. Notice, and unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write these things, saith, and he mentions Three things that identify him, identify his deity or divineness. The first is, amen. The Lord calls himself, amen. Now, why do people say amen in church? You may have said it and don't realize what you're saying. Even people that don't go to church say amen, say amen too. It means, let it be so. It has this idea of agreeing with the scripture, agreeing with God's testimony. And um, we thank the Lord that, that the church, the churches, including us tonight, can, can take the Lord at his word that he's not going to lie to us, that he is always going to be faithful. Uh, which brings us to the second name that he calls himself, not only amen, but faithful and true witness. Uh, our Lord Jesus is God's reliable witness. You, you can count on him. He doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Laodicean people, as well as us, can take the word at face value. He is true. Uh, We've read statements like, verily, verily, truly, truly. And uh, the word amen, those two go hand in hand. This is true. I would agree. Let it be so. And then the third thing the Lord identifies himself as the beginning of, of the creation of God. Jesus is the originator, someone stated, of God's creation. As we've been studying the Gospel of John, you cannot help when you study verse by verse like we've been doing on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And as we went through the book of Luke, I think it was five years, we went through the book of Luke. You cannot help but see that the Lord is the creator. In the Gospel of John, for example, he created wine. He created wellness in John chapter number 3, healing the nobleman. So in John chapter 5, the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. In John 9, he healed a man of blindness. And in John chapter number 6, he created food from five loaves and a few small fishes, fed a multitude, 5,000 plus people. He gave life to the man who died, who already had a funeral, and raised him from the dead. We know him to be Lazarus. In his prayer, as we studied in John 17, the Lord uttered these words, as thou has given him power over all flesh, referring to his own ability. The Lord Jesus is omnipotent, that is, he is all-powerful. But Jesus is also omniscient, that is, he is all-knowing. Look at verse number 15 now. And we will get into what we would frame the condition of the church, we're going to look at the condition of the church, the counsel to the church, and the call to the church. Notice he says this, and he says it over and over again. I know thy works. How does he know? Does someone give him the information? 
He knows because he sees it. He knows the heart of every individual. He knows every detail. He does not know by second-hand information or third-hand. He knows first-hand. In the, one of the previous letters, we are reminded that I am he which searcheth the rings in the hearts. He knows everything. So when we see this, this reminds us then that if he knows the churches, then does he know you and I tonight? He knows whether or not you're a Christian. He knows whether or not you're in fellowship with him. He knows thy works, what you do with your time, your talent, and your treasures. But we see also the Lord desire, what he desires for the people there in Laodicea. Notice he says here in verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Now pause right there for just a moment. Why would Jesus say that he would rather have you cold or hot? If you're like me, I've read plenty of books on the subject that we are to be on fire for God. We're to be hot for, for the Lord in a sense, spiritually hot. I've read hardly any books. I don't remember reading any material on the idea of cold. But Laodicea in their history has had water from two resources. Heriopolis, the hot mineral spring. I don't know if you've ever been to the hot mineral springs in Hamas Mountains there and other places, and, and there are different hot springs throughout the country. It's, it's a refreshing feeling to be able to have. It's a therapeutic healing source, the minerals there. Hot water. And then you had the cold, freezing water that came down from the mountains in Colossae from the snow cap, and they would desire water. So they have history where they tried to channel water from the mineral springs and water from Colossae. And when it eventually got to the area that we look at as Laodicea, it was lukewarm. I don't know about you, but if I have a hot cup of coffee, I like it hot, not lukewarm. If I have a cup of water, I don't want it lukewarm water. I want it ice cold or leaning in the cold direction. The idea, and I don't want to spiritualize this much, is that the lukewarmness represents something that God does not desire. The mineral will represent the healing. The cold water will represent refreshing. Those are original. But the lukewarm was something, according to John, as he writes here, is something the Bible says in verse 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Now, a lot of people have taken that to mean that, was well, this referring to that you can lose your salvation? And we take the position that you can't. You say, why? Well, you can grieve the Spirit of God, and you can quench the Spirit of God within you, but you cannot lose the Holy Spirit because you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And you cannot be a Christian apart from the Holy Spirit of God. That's what Romans chapter 8 teaches us. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So what is the Lord saying here? Uh, well, the answer then will come to our, our, our text as we look at. This is the condition. Uh, notice, why is the Lord saying what he just said, what we just read there? Notice in verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. Let that sink in for just a moment. These are people, and mind you, they have some influence. Mind you, they do have some wealth. They're pretty well off. Uh, they resisted Rome's help in a time of earthquake because they had the resources but more important than that, they said no to God. They didn't even need the Lord. They had money, they had material blessings, but all of these can become a curse when you begin to trust in them and they hinder you from having a relationship with the Lord God. 
in the Bible. And I find this interesting. Many believers in the world that profess to know God and even unbelievers do not recognize and realize that it's God who gives them the ability to create any sense of wealth. Deuteronomy in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 8.18 says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. And no matter what amount of wealth God may entrust you and I with, we are not, and I repeat again, we are not to trust in our earthly riches. Can I get a witness? Amen? In the New Testament book of Timothy, we are told, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. There was a lady that was interviewed by one of the networks, and she basically is a rice uh, advocate. She was in North Korea as a uh, young lady and fled that country. And she was talking about the poverty there in North Korea and how they basically live to survive. Very little thought is given to education. They have training camps, which are really work camps, slave camps. But she brought something uh, in the interview that I saw her share. And it says, did you know that the World Bank groups and the United Nations have what they believe are called sustainable developmental goals. And that is the United Nations wants everybody to have the same amount of money to be able to spread throughout the whole world. In other words, if you're a hardworking individual, the United Nations goal is to take from your bank account, your savings account, and give to somebody else that may not have it. They use the standard of living, that is the United Nations, in their sustainable development of goals of $1.90 a day as a poverty line. Now, I did a little math on that. $1.90 a day times 30 comes to $57 a month. You multiply that by 12 months, you get $684 a year. And I would say if you are having a dollar ninety a day economic income, that's pretty rough. Would you say that? Compared to Americans, compared to people here in New Mexico, if you do a study, you can go on Google or whatever search engine you have there. Uh, in twenty twenty, I think the median, the low or the average income of New Mexicans was twenty four thousand dollars a year. The Lord is reminding us through John here that whatever they are, the Lord is certainly not happy. He's not excited about them. He doesn't have a commendation to give them, none whatsoever. But because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. But what is God's perspective of this people? It's one thing to look at yourself. It's one thing to look at your financial portfolio per se and everything you you hold in high esteem like they did but what it was God's perspective of this people in this congregation he says and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked interesting isn't it uh, we can think one way of ourselves and God has a different perspective about us. The Bible reminds us, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. I don't know if you've ever driven by any of these casinos. Do you ever figure out how they can stay afloat? It's because people lose money all the time. But a lot of people might spend their money previously without any concern about some basics like food and, and infrastructure costs like electricity and gas and so, et cetera, et cetera. And they hurt themselves. They hurt themselves. They hurt their families. I do know this. God has never 
promise to make you rich financially. We look in the Bible, we find men in the Old Testament like Abraham, David, and Solomon, they were wealthy. We find this in the New Testament, that if you have whatever amount of wealth you have, you are to be content with such things as you have. For God has said he will never leave us nor forsake us. So we see the condition of, of the church. Secondly, we see the counsel to the church. God has something to say to each of these churches, and I must hurry up. Verse number 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and, 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 and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesalve, and that thou mayest See, if there were believers in this congregation, that would be a big question mark. God has reminded them to get the truth from him, and the truth would represent the word of God, and the word of God will work in someone's life that will be comparable to someone's life being tried in the hardships and the trials, like gold and fire, refined. It's our understanding that if your relationship with God is more important than anything in the world, that you will endure hardship and you will grow in your faith. Do you understand this if, as a child of God? That when your faith is in God and His truth, that you are in a spiritual sense the richest kid in town? Do you know that? You have salvation, eternal life. You have access to the throne of God. You have the promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit in you. You have the promises of God. You have the family of God. And I could go on and on. You are forgiven. There is no shame, but mercy is now part of your life. The compassions of the Lord are renewed daily, and great is thy faithfulness. You see God answer prayer. You see his divine plan unfold in your life. You see the faithfulness of God unfolding moment by moment. Well, the church here had some, if there were any saved people, has some good counsel. And we can take heart that God is concerned for all the decisions. Now I must hasten verse number 19. Notice it goes further. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, if there were believers in this church, then God is calling for repentance, a change of attitude, change of mind, change of heart. And if there were believers in the church and they don't repent, there are consequences to behavior. Would you agree with that? And the word chasten and, and the word love, a, a lot of people want to put God under, put God on trial because they would say, well, God would never do that to a believer. God would never do that to, or, or how, can, how can a loving God bring discipline and correction to his own? Well, here's a text. As many as I love, I what? I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So there's some good counsel, and uh, it will be a wonderful thing in anyone's life to get a fresh look at the truths of God's word and fall in love with the Lord in a sense and recognize he does care for you. Which brings us now to verse number 20. We see the character or the, the characteristics of a church. We see the counsel, and lastly, we see the continued knocking at this church's door. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door at, and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Where is the Lord in regards to this congregation? He's on the outside. He is not on the inside. He's on the outside. Knocking. So if you take the position that there are People that profess are that, that are saved, the Lord is obviously wanting to get their attention. But if you take the position, and I lean towards this position, that the congregation here are made up of people that call themselves Christians, 
call themselves believers, but they are not. You can be in in a church service. You can say you're a Christian and not be born again, not be saved. There are lots of people all over the world that are such. So here we find Jesus knocking at the door. Knocking on the heart's door of someone. Jesus wants to come in. And the greatest blessing that we could have is a fellowship with God. Notice he presents himself as wanting to spend time with them. And and the incentive or maybe to this idea of witnessing to someone is, don't you want to get in fellowship? Don't you want to know who the Lord is? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Over the years, I've had the privilege of working with individuals and in Bible study groups and my own family. And I remember my own father. He was one of the men that said the statement every time we got around to witnessing and I'm encouraging him to get saved. And, and thank God he came to a church service and, and uh, responded to the gospel message. But he said this on more than one occasion. He said, son, God is knocking on my door. Perhaps someone is listening tonight. God has been knocking on your door. God wants to be your savior. God wants to have communion and fellowship with you. Sup with you. A closeness. And he with me. That is a very precious, precious picture here. And maybe for someone that has stepped out of fellowship. Maybe someone that's put more emphasis on material goods. Maybe their job perhaps. Maybe on finances and things of this world. Instead of on God. There's a promise for you and I. You say what might that be? If we confess our sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God still cares about us. God still loves us. We may have to have some correction. Some discipline. But God means well for the child of God. Doesn't he? In closing here, now we come to what has been given to previous churches, to him that overcome it. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne? Overcome it, the idea of having faith in God. The things of this world and the world itself will pass away. But he that doeth the will of God will abide forever. We're going to go to a far better place as children of God to be in the presence of our Savior. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Isn't it very interesting that the Lord closes the final message to the seven churches of Asia Minor with a knock at the door? I want to come in. I want to be part of your life. And the same would be true today. Because what's going to take place next? We don't know when that event will take place. It is the taking up of the saints. The rapture of the church. God's people in a moment snatched up. And this week, I understand there's been a lot of information flowing on the news networks about UFOs, unidentified objects. I just got a feeling that when Christians are snatched up, there's going to be a lot of discussion that it was the UFOs that took them up. That's probably going to be their explanation. No, the Bible teaches us that Jesus said this was going to happen. And the next chapter in Revelation chapter number 4, now it's going to take place. When that voice of God and the trump of God will sound. And the church that was living here on the earth. And you may be the only generation that will never see death. Will be summoned up into glory. So this calling. This knocking. Is vitally important for us to understand. And if we take it to heart. Then then we need to share the gospel with others. We need to warn the wicked of his way. And the gospel is good news. And the good news is for the wicked and every sinner out there. We that have sinned against God. 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and tell him what God did. And what God did was he sent his only son, the dear Lord Jesus, and who died in our place. Yesterday was Valentine's Day. I saw some precious posts on what social media, what social media uh, we saw. And, and maybe you got a card and maybe you wrote something along the lines that I love you. And, and maybe you made heart signs to people. And, and uh, maybe you gave a heart-shaped box of chocolate to someone. Maybe flowers. And maybe you gave an embrace and, and uh, told them happy Valentine's Day. It's always, I would say, an encouraging time when Something like that happens to you. But think about this. God sent His only Son, heaven's best, to this earth and demonstrated His love by allowing His Son to die in our place, shed His blood, and to be buried and to rise again on the third day. You say, why did He do that? He did that so your soul could be saved. He did that so your sins could be forgiven. He did that so that you might sup with Him and He with you throughout your life and have the fellowship and the closeness of God. This church said, I need nothing. I have no need of anything. In many respects, including the God that gave them life. And so what God said? said, you're like lukewarm. I'm going to spoo thee out. You make me sick. And so I pray that's no one listening tonight. That you will have an open heart. That you will say, like we sung that song tonight, I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. Lord, we thank You for Your precious Word. We thank You for the letters that You've given to the churches here. We thank You that John was able to record them. And Lord, that the messengers were able to give them. And Lord, as You have spoken to all of these churches, I pray You will speak to us. May the truth of the Word of God continue to reign and guide and help us make the decisions that will bring glory and honor to you. Save that one who is yet to receive you as Savior. Continue to knock on their door. Continue to help us to lean and to trust in you instead of the things of this world. The Lord will give you thanks. Continue to guide us in our study of your Word as we go forward into the next chapter. And all God's people can say, Amen and Amen.